work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. At that point, they would be magically created separate kinds and distinctly unique from those listed around it, as well as those apparently ancestral to it. So creationists have to show at least a handful of these barramans and show how we can distinguish them from their parent categories. This is the phylogeny challenge, the most damning argument there is against creationism, and no creationist can meet that challenge because they know this mystic boundary they allude to isn't really there. They made it up in an attempt to deny an abundantly evident reality. R. N. Ra proposes what is called the phylogeny challenge. R. N. Ra is clearly not up to date with the scientific data that confirms separate ancestry. R. N. proposes that all life is related through common ancestry. That's right. R. N. believes banana plants and whales are related. And he even calls this science. We have genetic related data that confirms separate ancestry and refutes Aaron's ancestry related challenges. Using mitochondrial DNA, we can trace migration patterns. We can determine ancestry and we can answer some remarkably interesting questions pertaining to our origins. Firstly, mitochondrial DNA is only inherited from the mother's side. And we know that the majority of DNA differences in the mitochondrial DNA have to be due to mutation. The evolutionists assume that the ultimate source of genetic variation is mutations over time, while creationists propose the created heterozygosity hypothesis. Now, one thing we can do through the uniparentally inherited DNA compartments like the mitochondrial DNA here is we can trace time. For example, when did these DNA differences arise? Since both creationists and evolutionists can agree that these DNA differences are the result of mutations over time, these DNA compartments, the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, are the best to look at to determine ancestry. Because evolutionists, as I've stated, assume that the vast majority of nuclear DNA differences are the result of mutations while creationists invoke design diversity. Now going back to the mitochondrial DNA, are the number of DNA differences in this DNA compartment of humans more consistent with universal common ancestry or separate ancestry? When we use the empirical method to measure the rate as to which the DNA changes in this DNA compartment, we find that the rate is fast, much faster than the evolutionary community had ever predicted. The mutation rate in the mitochondrial DNA demonstrates that the mother of us all, Eve, lived just thousands of years ago. This data both confirms separate ancestry and refutes universal ancestry. This data essentially refutes Aaron Ra's challenges concerning ancestry. No, banana plants and whales are not related through common ancestry. In the mitochondrial DNA, there are far too few DNA differences in the world. Evolutionists attempt to put mitochondrial Eve hundreds of thousands of years ago. And that is just not what we find. We have scientific evidence confirming the biblical Eve. And the evolutionists have been incapable of refuting this data. Mitochondrial DNA trees, for example, grow in branching like patterns. We can literally reverse the clock back to the point where we would find Eve. We know Eve would have had children, and her children would have had children. Every time a child is born, there is then a chance that the child would have a mutation. A mutation is a copying error. Now, every time a mutation happens, the result would be a new branch on the family tree. Over time, the family tree gains more and more branches due to these copying errors. We can then back this process up to where we eventually find the woman of whom we have all descended from. I also want to point out the fact that we can count the number of mutations found in people today. All we really find is about 20 to 30 mutations that separate most people in the world today from our Eve ancestor.
it is extremely easy to account for the amount of DNA differences in the mitochondrial DNA, especially when we start from Eve just 6,000 years ago. The data does not fit deep time evolution and universal common ancestry. What we see is evidence for one woman. There are far too few mutations. We have a fast mutation rate and a pattern that is expected if the biblical model of ancestry were true. The other unique parentally inherited DNA compartment is the Y chromosome. And even the Y chromosome has extremely low variation. Every single male Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical. The Y chromosome, just like the mitochondrial DNA, is also fast. It picks up about one mutation every generation, and there are only a few hundred mutations separating people worldwide. And our last Y chromosomal ancestor being Noah existed just 4,500 years ago. This is all inconsistent with universal common ancestry. And so we have the mitochondrial DNA in humans. That's nothing like the chimpanzee mitochondrial DNA. And we also have the Y chromosome that is incredibly different between humans and chimpanzees. When we consider overall architecture, gene content, and size differences, our Y chromosome is less than 35% dissimilar to the chimpanzee Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is non-recombining DNA. It should be relatively stable. And yet we see a highly divergent Y chromosome. How does Aaron Ra explain this massive problem for his model of ancestry? Another amazing line of evidence that refutes Aaron Ra's position of universal common ancestry has to do with the structure of human chromosomes. Human chromosomes are made up of relatively large linkage blocks. And it turns out that analyses of these original text strings tells us what? It tells us that the genome is young. And the reason is because the genome has only been partially scrambled crossovers and gene conversions should scramble all linkage blocks quite quickly in an evolutionary time frame. This is a major problem for evolutionary theory. And how does Aaron Ra explain this data? Shut like, up! We've also got recent data that confirms genetic boundaries in species. Aaron Ra asks, where are the boundaries in ancestry? There's no evidence for biblical kinds, and yet we have this data that suggests over 90% of all species today have originated at the same time. This is all perfectly consistent with the biblical model of ancestry and vastly inconsistent with universal ancestry. Aaron Ra might say, the created heterozygosity hypothesis is just a post hoc argument, when in fact, the design diversity hypothesis makes testable predictions many of them being confirmed. Evolutionists have assumed lots of evolutionary leftovers, junk DNA and genomic fossils. And this is because of their starting point. Remember, they assume that the ultimate source of genetic variation is mutation. Evolutionists have assumed millions of years of unguided and unintelligent evolutionary change. And that's why they expect so much junk and so much evolutionary leftovers. But we as biblical creationists, we would expect, based on the created heterozygosity hypothesis, genomes of treasure, we would predict function, while evolutionists mostly predict non-function. And it turns out we have preliminary evidence for genome-wide functionality. We can also safely predict that much of the genome is involved in embryological development. We have windows of development that consist of incredible growth. The trajectory of discovery strongly favors biblical creation and once again refutes universal ancestry. The entire junk DNA paradigm has been overturned. This also includes many of the so-called greatest lines of evidence for universal ancestry, which assume junk DNA. For example, we now know that pseudogenes, ERVs, ALU sequences, and other types of genomic fossils are highly functional and active and necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. Even the chromosome two fusion has been completely overturned. Another amazing line of evidence that confirms the design diversity hypothesis is the epigenome. 
We have this entire additional layer of complexity and functional information that evolutionary mechanisms cannot account for. The epigenome controls how the genes make the physical parts of our cells. And this extra layer of amazing information helps turn genes on and off and not change the actual genetic code itself. Our genes are not all turned on at the same time. This would not be good. These are non-random changes. Good design, as we know, means we need to have some type of control, a type of control that makes sure we have the right things being turned on and the right things being turned off. This is all forward thinking, which points us back to the forward thinker, the forward thinker that Aaron Ra wants to reject. How do evolutionary processes design that which requires forward thinking? Will Aaron Ra propose that evolutionary mechanisms have a mind? Remember, Aaron Ra assumes that the ultimate source of genetic variation and the originator of these DNA differences are mutations. Well, from one generation to the next, many mutations are passed on, roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation. We are consistently more mutant than our parents. As a matter of fact, we are all multiply mutant which is why selection is limited. This is 100 typographical errors every generation that our parents did not have. Natural selection must remove or filter out these mutations or else we will go extinct. Mutations in general put shelf lives on genomes, which is why RN Ra does not have deep time. Banana plants and whales are not related. Most mutations are nearly neutral and only slightly deleterious. These low impact mutations are only slightly harmful to the point where they do not really affect reproduction. Selection cannot see these. These low impact deleterious mutations, these nearly neutral mutations are invisible to selection. And therefore what type of selection can RN Ra present us with that can remove that which is invisible? This evidence suggests that species are going downhill. And Aaron Ra, once again, does not have millions of years of evolutionary advancement. Remember, time is the god. Time is the hero of the plot for Aaron Ra. But Aaron Ra does not have the time. And even with the time, based on what we know of low impact deleterious mutation accumulation, more time equals more extinction, more degeneration not large-scale evolution. We also see a perfect biological decay curve that matches the biblical model of longer lives closer to the creation. We see that it drops off significantly after the flood. This data has almost no chance at being coincidence. This is an amazing correlation between what we know about mutation accumulation, genetic degeneration, and biblical longevity. It makes absolutely no sense that the biblical authors would ever make this up. Also, fabricating this biological decay curve would require exceptional knowledge in statistics and mathematics. The systematic degeneration of man, as documented in the Bible, is extremely consistent with genetic entropy and deleterious mutation. The Genesis biological decay curve reflects real biology. Now, Aaron Ra argues all day that dogs and cats are apparently related simply because they are both carnivores and also mammals. And therefore, they are also related to bears since bears are also carnivores and in many ways share numerous features in terms of morphology, anatomy, physiology, and genetics with both dogs and cats. But this does not help Aaron Ra because the data suggests separate ancestry. Aaron Ra needs to demonstrate that dogs, cats, bears, and banana plants are related. He has not done that. Actually, the genetic data refutes that idea. Uh, who is the fraud? Who, who, is the, who is the fraudster? If you like this type of content, be sure to hit subscribe and also smash that like button. It actually does help. And I hope you all enjoyed this video. Goodbye, everybody.
SFT is out. <laughs>